Thank you for joining us on The Skeptic Sidekick, where we delve into ancient societies, the ghosts, the paranormal, UFOs, all looking at it from the perspective of the true believer and from the skeptic perspective. Joining me, my partner, my co-host, my sibling, Kimber Rodriguez. Myself, I am Richard Gregg. And again, let's look into being the skeptic psychic. Hello, and thank you once again for coming to the skeptic psychic. With me, as always, is the bright, wonderful, intelligent, very successful, wonderful sister of mine, Kimber Rodriguez. Hey, how's it going? How are you this week? Doing fine. How have you been? Oh, I've been okay. Just been sleeping a lot. I don't know what's up with me. I'm just super tired all the time. Mm. What's going on in your life? Kind of had an ear operation. Uh, it's hot as heck up here. We got a lot of forest fires. How did your surgery go? It went well. Uh, just they get to figure out why every two or three years they have to open up my ear and clean out a whole bunch of green gunk. Oh, goodness. That does not sound like fun. No. So I started watching the show that you recommended last recording, The Holzer, uh, Holzer Files with Dave Schrader. Oh, really? How are you liking it so far? I actually think it's pretty good. I like the fact that when the, the, you're playing back the recordings from his original investigations, he seemed very um, respectful and kind towards the spirits. Unlike a lot of the ghost hunting shows you see today where they're like almost harassing the spirits, wanting them to show themselves. On this one, he always says, you know, that he's going in with kind and love and respect for the dead. And so I, I really like that about him. That's well, kind of an interesting uh, newt point. In fact, uh, how about we discuss him today? The great and wonderful Hans Holzer. That sounds like a plan. All right. Now, he was born January 26, 1920 in Austria, not to be confused with Australia. In fact, he was born in Vienna. A lot of famous people were born in Vienna, such as Hedley de la Mar. So was uh, Johann Strauss II. John Banner, everybody knows that Sergeant Schultz from Hogan's Heroes. Famous director of uh, one of the greatest silent films, Fritz Lang. Don't think I've heard of... Not heard of what? Some of the people that you mentioned. I don't think a lot of our uh, listeners would have heard of them. You never heard of Christopher Waltz? No. Famous actor. Hedy Lamar? Never heard of her? Oh, well, I've heard of her, but... That's about the only one I've heard of. And while he's slowly decomposing Johann Strauss II. Interesting. Yes. And of course, Fritz Lang, who I was trying to uh, say, one of the greatest directors who directed the classic silent film, Metropolis. If you ever get a chance, watch it. It is really, really interesting. James Hershey, he's a pop singer. And so is Zoe Straub. Maximilian Schell, for you people who enjoyed The Black Hole, was born in 1930. Interesting. Now, tell us more about Hans Holzer, the Mad. Well, like I said, he was born uh, in Vienna, January 6th, 1920. Uh, January 26th, forgive me, January 26th, 1920. And he was known to repeat the ghost and fairy stories uh, from his Uncle Henry so much that when he got into uh, early kindergarten, got in trouble with the teachers as well as the school. What kind of stories did his Uncle Henry tell him? Ghost and fairy stories. Not too many little kindergartners like to hear stories about ghosts and hauntings, that sort of thing. And before his death, August 28 and 2009, at the age of 89, Holzer had authored nearly 140 books on the paranormal, extraterrestrial, witchcraft, and more, beginning with his first book, Ghost Haunter, in 1963. 
during a career that famously involved the so-called Annieville Horror in 1977. Holtz also taught parapsychology at the New York Institute of Technology and has both appeared and consulted for Leonard Nimoy's late 1970s TV show, of which, to me, one of the high standards of the 70s, In Search Of. And interesting enough, actor Dan Aykroyd, who, one of my favorite uh, comedic actors, claimed an obsession with uh, Hans Holzer and inspired him to write my all-time number one, uh, number two second favorite movie of all time, Ghostbusters. So what did Hans Holzer do other than just author all these books? Well, he was a uh, parapsychologist. He and his medium uh, actually went to uh, places to check it out. One of the most he used was uh, Ethel Johnson Myers, also Sibyl, Sibyl Leak, and Marissa Anderson. He's been credited as creating the term, the other side, although it's been used in 19th century spiritualism. He's also been coined the term ghost hunter. He's been the researcher and, and studying for most of his life, all the way up until, again, he was 89 years old, in the paranormal field. Now, what are your thoughts on trans mediums? Sometimes I kind of find them hard to believe. You're talking about the ones that actually go into a trance and have the spirits talking through them. Is that correct? Right. The ones who go into a trance and channel these spirits to come through them and speak through them. Sometimes I have a personally have a hard time believing in this. What are your thoughts on trans mediumship? Kind of the same way I feel about channeling. Explain. Basically, I kind of have a problem with something of a spirit taking over your body, even if you're willing to allow them to do that. And what is that problem that you have with it? Are you afraid of something negative entering or losing control? Uh, I have a problem with, one, losing control. Two, of it being hoo-ha. I like to use this word, barnumistic, meaning sometimes I think it may or may not be true. That makes any sense. Makes sense. So the reason why you don't channel, is that because of the fear of losing control or something unwanted being attached to you? Or what is the reason that you don't channel? Yes. Yes. Back to Holster. What are some of the famous hauntings that he has been known to investigate? Well, he actually investigated the Annieville Horror, which, if you know the story, the story before the story, uh, a gentleman by the name of Ronald DeFeo Jr. killed his entire family in this house in upstate New York. According to Hans Holzer, he may have been possessed by uh, an ancient Shinnecock Indian chief by the name of Rolling Thunder, driving him to murder his family. Photographers have taken at the scene revealed curious anomalies, such as uh, bullet holes made in the original murders, claimed to be uh, halos around the holes themselves. He claimed that the house was built on Indian sacred land, only to be denied by the Amityville Historic Societies, pointing out that the Shinnanooks were not on that land, but the Montaukets Indians were actually the original settlers. No one's been able to confirm or deny that there was any type of burial of an Indian chief. Hmm. My personal view of Amityville is that Rana DeFeo killed his family there and may have left a psychic impression. So you believe it's residual hauntings that were left over from this um, her horrendous crime that was committed? Yes. So I know a lot of people think that this was something that was concocted by the Lutz, that they sold their story to the author of the book to make some extra money because they moved into this place and couldn't afford it. So they created this story behind it to get out of their contract. There are people who believe that story, and then others believe that it was actually a haunting. Do you think that a lot of it was just concocted by them to get out of contract for something they got into they couldn't afford? No, not really, because in all honesty, from what I understood, Mr. Lutz 
was paying still on the place a year even after they left. Interesting. So what else can you tell us about Hans Hall, sir? Uh, he was married in 1962, has two daughters. One of them, of course, is uh, Alexandra, who is one of the executive producers of the show, The Holzer Files. And she wrote a book in 2008 called Growing Up Haunted, based on her life with her father and his paranormal quest. Interesting. He was a uh, vegetarian and teetotaler. Now, do you think that vegetarianism was due to spirituality, or do you think it was just because he had a love for all creatures and didn't want to eat any of God's creatures? Well, he was uh, also a Wiccan and believed in reincarnation, so maybe he believed that Bessie the Cow may have been a transcendental spirit, and that's just my opinion, not anybody else's but because he reincarnation, kind of felt like, you know, it wouldn't be right eating meat. It makes sense. Now, I'm assuming just like any other paranormal investigator, spiritualist, anyone dealing with parapsychology, I'm sure he had a skeptics. Is that correct? Yeah, he had people who believe that, you know, that he would jump on things that, uh, in fact, with the Amityville thing, he wrote a nonfiction book about the house. But then, of course, he wrote two novels, which means fiction. One called The Annuville Curse in 81 and The Secret of Annuville in 1985. Now, going back to his marriage, he had married Countess Catherine Genevieve Boxhovedin. Did uh, end a divorce a couple of years later, but it did give him two daughters, Alexandra and Aideen Windener of Manhattan, and five grandchildren. Being a field researcher, he always had a tape recorder ready, as well as a Polaroid camera, as well as a medium. Looking at some of the skepticism he faced in life, he was criticized in an article for the Journal for the Society of Psycho 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 Psychical Research that cast considerable doubt on the objectivity and reliability of his work. His work was widely criticized as being pseudoscience. Also, skeptical investigator Joe Nickel wrote, Pulsar did not provide verification for some of his claims, and he accepted spirit photographs and incidental reports and other doubtful evidence prejudicially. He also wrote that Pulsar's mediums offered unsubstantial and unverifiable claims or information that can be gleaned from research sources or knowledgeable people through cold readings. Also, fellow ghost hunter Peter Underwood wrote an obituary for Holster in The Guardian, and it disputed Holster's claim that the house of Amityville was built on the burial grounds. So that was disputing that claim that we discussed earlier. So that's just a little bit of skepticism that he faced in his life. But I know for the most part, he's considered the original ghost hunter, um, the first ghost hunter, or the most popular ghost hunter. Anything else we can discuss on the whole, sir? He did actually the Whaley House, which is one of the most haunted places in the United States, which is uh, located in the wonderful city of San Diego, California, of which I spent maybe about a year there. I saw the episode they did on the Holster Files of the Whaley House. That place is pretty creepy. Yes. I've been to actually the Whaley House. Did you have any experiences while you were there? I could never go upstairs for the life of me. Did you feel like something was holding you back, or...? I wouldn't say uh, holding me back. It's just... I kind of felt like I should not go upstairs. That's the only thing I'm going to say. I had no purpose being upstairs. Hmm, interesting. Tell us some more about his findings at the Whaley House. Well, some people believe it was actually a gentleman that was uh, hung there that stayed around. Say sometimes you can hear somebody walking upstairs when everyone's pretty much downstairs. Like a thunk, thunk. Now, Holster believed that it wasn't the guy, 
but another person. And if you watch the episode of the Holzer Files, whatever's there is malevolent. And did not like Dave Schrader, by the way. What I think is very interesting is the fact that these hauntings were occurring even when the Whaley's lived there. So this is definitely something that's been around much longer than what most people are aware of. Most people think that the haunting started after the Whaley's passed. But like you said, if you watch the episode, you find out that that's not the case. Well, like I said, I'm going to leave a uh, link in the file, the address of the Whaley house in San Diego, in case people are interested in that. Okay. Like I said, he was a very thorough and understanding researcher when it came to it. Whether you believe him or not, he went in and actually examined the information made his own assessments, and he was working pretty much until the day he died, which was the 26th of April of 2009. He was 89 years old. Interesting. So are there any other um, hauntings or investigations that he's well known for or any of them that stand out to you? The Morris Jamel Mansion. It is a uh, museum in Manhattan, New York. It is perceived by many as a paranormal site and has attracted academics, investigators, including Hans Holbrook, Zach Baggins, and the Tennessee Wraith Chasers. The story behind that is the Morris Jamel Mansion was completed at 1765 as a summer house for British Colonel Roger Morris and his wife Mary Phillips. On approximately 135 acres of land, it was stretched from Harlem to Hudson Rivers between what is now 155th and 165th Street. The country estate was called Mount Morris and being situated in the highest point of Manhattan. With the outbreak of the American Revolutionary War in 1776, Morris family had abandoned their southern home. Now, during the autumn of that same year, General Washington and the, the Continental officers occupied the house and made it its headquarters from September 14th to October 21st. A brief time, it served as a tavern and hosted dinner for President Washington on July 10th, 1790. And that's the history of it. Okay. Now tell us about the haunting. It is supposedly haunted by Elsa Jamel. She's the former mistress of the mansion and has been seen wandering the house in a purple dress, rapping on walls and windows. Her and her husband, Stephen, took control of the house in 1810. Marriage was quite tumultuous as Eliza was supposedly having an affair with Aaron Burr. Ooh. Stephen met his death as he mysteriously fell on a pitchfork in a cellar in 1832. Without wasting any time, Elsa married Aaron Burr. Hmm. Divorcing him three years later for still playing around at the age of 80, Burr did not die long after. She continued to call herself Mrs. Burr because of his notoriety. Eventually, Elsa's mental health deteriorated into Alzheimer's. The haunting soon began after her death at age 90 in 1865, where she was seen wandering around the property in a white dress and producing spine-tingling noises. When a psychic went to the mansion and preferably summoned the spirit of Stephen Jamel, the spirit said he was murdered and buried alive. In 1964, Elsa, wearing a violet dress, supposedly appeared to some school children and yelled at them to shut up. They identified her when they viewed the life-size portrait of her and her grandchildren. Now, Hans Holster had two seances there in 65, but heard nothing from Elsa. Elsa complained her first husband, Stephen Jamel, complained about it. Since then, visitors complained to seeing a drunken soldier on the staircase, Eliza Jamel bumping forth in the night, and her two former husbands quarreling in the cellar. That is the uh, ghost supposedly haunting the Morris Jamel mansion. Interesting. I know um, on the Holster Files, they did go there as well, and they encountered her spirit as well as something more sinister. My wondering is... He spent so much time communicating with the other side while he was alive. Has there been any communication with him since he's passed on to the other side? I have not uh, heard anything about him being reached out and asked from the other side whether he's alive or not. Hmm, interesting. But I'm going to find out for you. 
Okay. No, no one's actually reached out uh, and say that he's on the other side. I guess they just let him rest in peace. I guess so. It is um, obvious that he did live quite a fulfilling life in the paranormal. He did contribute quite a bit to it. Anything else we can touch on with Hulser before wrapping this up this week? Even though he was known for having his Polaroid and his tape player as well as his uh, psychic medium with him, he didn't like uh, electronic gadgetry protecting cold spots, magnetic anomalies and the like and prefer direct communications through the medium. Interesting. Now, just to name off a few of his books, including Ghost Hunter in 1963, he wrote Ghosts I've Met in 65, Yankee Goats, Ghosts, not Goats, Ghosts in uh, 66, The Great... Yes, Yankee Goats. You need to, to be careful with those goats. They can be pretty haunting. Right, fun thing to hear at night. You're there trying to sleep, and all of a sudden you start hearing. Yeah. You look around, and there's nothing. Yeah. Next thing you know, you feel something spearing me in the buttocks. Yes, they're like, <laughs> boy, dad, never forget. <laughs> Buffy. Yes, going. Remember. Okay, sorry about that. Dad! Bobby! Sorry. He also had a wide range of interest in paranormal phenomena and the occult, reflecting in books as varied as Beyond Medicine, 73, Inside Witchcraft in 1980, and Love Beyond the Grave in 1992. Now, he did see uh, life on the other side in sharp detail, you know, saying that the dead who become restless and wish to return to Earth for another go-around must fall in line and register with the clerk. Ah, oh, so he did believe in um, reincarnation? Yes. Again, I stated once before that he believed in reincarnation. I'm sorry, I missed that. That's okay. Well, I know we had talked about him, possibly. That's why he didn't uh, mm -hmm. eat meat. You, you, that was your yeah. theory, but here it kind of does specify that yes he did believe in reincarnation I mean, he viewed ghosts as well as their spiritual cousins as stay behinds and as a fellow human being in trouble he felt strongly that the tragedies would ensnare unfortunate souls and trap them between the spirit world and this one do you have anybody that you would like to recommend this week i'd actually like to uh recommend i want to say it's called the unbelievers podcast how about you, as I'm getting this information out? The Paranormal Mysteries podcast, hosted by Nick Ryan. Reading from his description, he takes you on a weekly journey into the strange but true world of the unexplained and supernatural phenomenon. Uh, topics include historical accounts and listener stories involving ghosts, aliens, UFOs, Bigfoot, and more. And I'll go ahead and leave a link to his website. The Unbelievers Podcast is a paranormal comedy podcast started in 2018 by host Russ Ryan, Dre Amora, Jude Prestia, and producer Rob Oki. It is following in the footsteps of its uh, predecessor, the Un Unbelievable Podcast, created by Brian Frangle. It carries on tradition of analyzing and exploring strange and unbelievable topics weekly as you continue to learn to unlearn everything you know. And while it does kind of get goofy and laughable at times, it does actually deal with some very uh, interesting topics. They like Bigfoot and other cryptos, UFOs, hauntings, that sort of thing. And it does it in such a teasing way. Interesting. And I'll leave that link up on our website as well. Okay. We are going to have our first interview on our next recording. And it'll be Jennifer Moore. She is a mentor and healer for sensitive and intuitive women. She has a master's degree in psychology and religion. <clears throat> and is also a, an accredited master trainer for EFT International. 
and founder of the Empathic Mastery Academy. So we will be interviewing her on our next recording. Anything else you'd like to add this week? Apple Podcasts. We did actually get a five stars. We don't know who it was, but they gave us five stars and didn't leave us a review. So we'd like to actually know who our mysterious five-star benefactor is. And we'd like to share your name, if it's okay with you, on our wonderful uh, website, as well as talk about how wonderful you are on our podcast. If you get a five-star on our review, we'll say your name. We'll sing praises upon thy wonder. Yes. Five stars. Actually, any review we'll read online. Just please, please leave us a review. Okay. The reviews are what helps us to go up in the world of Apple so that people can find our podcasts easier. Because sharing is caring. Yes. We have some great things coming up in the future, which um, are in the works in the background. And once we have them available, we will discuss them on the podcast. If you have anything that you would like to share, any ideas you would like for us to discuss, anybody that would like to be interviewed on our show or any stories you want to share, you can always email us at info at skepticpsychic.com. You can also reach us at our website, skepticpsychic.com. There you can check out a blog that we have as well as our photo gallery. Anything else you'd like to add tonight? Well, we love you. and We look forward to hearing from you. Yes. And... Thank you to our listeners that have been tuning in each week. And I said, we love all our listeners and our Facebook group, Skeptic Psychic. Is always there for you. Yes. And pleasant dreams, everyone. Unpleasant nightmares. Have a great week. Good night. Good night.